Greetings. So over the years, people have asked us many times at ICI 3D, how do I tell if I have a good model? I don't know that I'm going to be able to get very far in answering that question in the next half hour or so, but I do want to talk to you about some of the thoughts that I've had in talking to people about various aspects of that problem. Um, one of the first things that comes to my mind is that any model is only good or bad for a specific purpose. So I'm going to talk a little bit about different goals you might have for your model and different types of models we might use for different goals. I'm going to talk a little more about the value of simulating for validating models. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about evaluating fit, and I'm going to discuss a very common answer to the question, do I have a good model, which is the answer of using a goodness of fit test. Um, goodness of fit tests have their place, but in my opinion, they're often misunderstood and often misused. Um, so to know whether I have a good model, I'm first going to ask, what is my model trying to accomplish? A model can be used to simply generate hypotheses that might be then tested um, through experiment and observation. A model might be used to evaluate plausibility of certain mechanisms. A model might be used to try to make specific predictions. How much COVID do we think we're going to have in Ontario if we do or don't reopen the schools or the bars? A model might aim at mechanistic understanding. What are the factors that cause a disease to spread in one place than another? And therefore, perhaps what might we be able to do to control disease spread better? And we can use a model to evaluate different scenarios that combines different components of what I've already talked about under both prediction and mechanistic understanding. Again, what might happen if we do A or if we do B? So the first kind of models that we talked to you when we were outlining dynamical modeling are conceptual models. And a very famous conceptual model is the one that underlies the whole idea of R0, the whole idea that we can reduce disease at the population level to zero, even if we don't reduce the risk factors that underlie disease spread to zero. In other words, that if we reduce the number of mosquitoes in a population from this level to this level, we may reduce the number of new cases per case below one. And without getting anywhere near zero new cases per case, we might still expect the disease to gradually go extinct from a population. This is a conceptual model, which has illuminated many more specific models and which is useful in itself. Another example of a conceptual model is one that I developed with Lindsay Keegan, who worked with me at McMaster and was an ICI 3D student. And this was a model that we used to test the plausibility of the idea that clinical immunity might be important for malaria persistence in certain communities. So the idea here is that people <clears throat> who've had malaria many times are less likely to feel acute symptoms from malaria infection and may therefore be less likely to seek medical treatment and cures which kill the plasmodium, which kill the pathogens that cause malaria. And we wanted to ask, is it plausible that under certain circumstances, this fact that people aren't getting sick and aren't seeking treatment might help malaria persist. And that if malaria could be temporarily beaten to a low level in some of these communities so that more people started feeling sickness, started recognizing malaria, started seeking care, maybe malaria could be eliminated. So we created a very simple conceptual model where people could be either naive or clinically immune, and within each category could either have a current malaria infection or not. And we made all, and we made a model diagram and we asked under what circumstances with the same parameters 
might we have two different equal? So here's a picture of a classic disease system. This is very similar to the Ross example I showed you before that under many circumstances, we might expect that as the basic reproductive number increases, um, we have a smooth transition when R0 equals one to an endemic level of malaria estimated here by the amount of infectious bites per person per year. But if the effects of clinical immunity and drug treatment are strong enough, we might get a very different picture. We might get a picture driving R0 below zero, sorry, driving R0 below one would not necessarily make the disease go extinct because even if the your model does not exactly match the real world. And therefore, the last thing you want to do is look at statistical tests that say, well, can I tell the difference between the real data and my model prediction with the hope that you won't see a clear difference? The whole idea that P greater than 0.05 is a good thing very often comes up in model evaluation. I want to say, well, there's no difference between my model and the real world. This connects to sloppy statistical talk. And it's never true. There is a difference between your model and the real world. The difference is meaningful. The questions you want to know is how large is it, not how clearly can you see it. Um, and that's the potential problem with a goodness of fit test. A goodness of fit statistic is a useful thing in many cases. A goodness of fit statistic is one way to describe how well your model prediction matches observed data. They can be used to compare different models. The problem or the potential problem is when we look at goodness of fit tests and we say, is the difference between the model and the data significant? And significant, of course, is a piece of statistical jargon. What it means is not, is the difference important? It's not, is the difference real? It's do I see the difference clearly? And so we want to avoid at all costs saying, well, the difference isn't significant. So the model and the data are the same and the model is right or the model is true. The model is false or at least incomplete and no goodness of fit test will make it true. There's lots of good ways to pass a goodness of fit test. I'm sorry. There are no good ways to try to pass a goodness of fit test test. There are a lot of ways to pass a goodness of fit test. Your model might be good. That certainly increases the likelihood that you won't see the difference between the model or the data. But you could also have a model that makes very broad predictions that isn't very precise. Um, you could have very noisy data. Or you could have some sort of, there are other technical things that people do, usually accidentally, I hope that end up by having non-significant goodness of fit tests. You want to be very, very careful before you look at the significance of your goodness of fit test. And here's the digression where I repeat myself. Why do we use p-values in biology? Certainly, I can make any model pass a goodness of fit test by broadening the uncertainty. That does not make it a good model. Um, the key to statistical significance is not whether something is large and not whether something is important. An effect is statistically significant if we can clearly see the sign, right? So in this case, the effects of vitamin supplementation on weight and fat fold are apparently large and probably important but we can't be sure because there's a wide uncertainty and we can't even be sure they're positive enough, positive or not. The effect on iron is positive, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's more important. Um, I also talked about the example where I nearly made a complete fool of myself by looking at point estimates and p-values for influenza. And again, these numbers, the estimated number of people killed by influenza are larger than the number killed by weather and the p-values are lower. We're confident that the effect of more flu is more deaths. We're not confident that the effect 
of colder weather is more deaths through the winter. But neither does the p-value tell us anything about size or importance. As far as we know from this particular study, cold weather might well be the most important of these three killers. So that's really the review part. I'm gonna stop myself from saying more, much more about it because I've said plenty about it um, before, but I'll just remind you, a low p-value means we see something clearly. A high p-value means we don't see anything clearly. We sometimes base scientific conclusions on low p-values. We saw something clearly, but usually we wanna know what we saw. We never hang a scientific conclusion on a high p-value. Um, and I'm just going to move on. How does that relate to our goodness effect of fitness? Our model is not reality. The null hypothesis is always going to be false. And so the goodness of fit test is asking us in some sense, do we think we can see the difference clearly? If we can't see the difference clearly, the model may be good. The model may be bad we probably can't just add more complexity than the model based on the current data. We may need to refine the model, we may, may need to gather more data, but we may be at a temporary dead end. If yes, if we can see the difference between our model and the data clearly, that does not necessarily mean the model is bad. For almost any biological model, if we have good enough data, we'll be able to see a clear difference between the model and the data because the model world is not the real world. That's not a problem. On the other hand, if you can clearly see a difference, it may mean that you can add more complexity to your model and take another step down the inference pathway. Doesn't mean that you have to. One way to evaluate a model is to ask, what patterns do I want the model to capture? So Tom was talking about that today, my time, talking about what are the aspects of dengue that he's hoping his model is going to be able to see before he trusts his model? We could use a goodness of fit statistic for this. We could say we want the difference between our model and the data to be not larger than something. And we can use expert opinion to either for the goodness of fitness statistic or just directly to look at the features and the relationships of the real data and the model data and see if we think things are captured. We can also go beyond the data that we fit our model to. We can ask, does our model make predictions outside the range that we calibrated it on? And that's a really effective way to compare models to the real world. Some of you will be familiar with the dramatic validation of Einstein's theory of relativity um, when it was predicted that certain stars would not seem to be where classical physics would have expected them to be during a solar eclipse. Um, so we can actually see the stars shifting in a way that was predicted by Einstein. Something closer to what we're doing is we may try to get certain sorts of parameters about cholera from data in Haiti and ask if we can predict cholera outbreaks in Bangladesh. Or we might be using, we've discussed this today as well, we might be using the past to predict the future, right? So a lot of people are fitting models to historical disease data and then evaluating them year after year on new seasonal disease outbreaks, as in the case of influenza. Um, we can predict way out of sample. This is a picture that I really like a lot, but fairly tangential. Um, this is one of the rings of Saturn. These are two of the moons of Saturn. And somebody predicted, somebody basically said, this ring has a cleaner shape than can be predicted from any known theory. And guessed that there would be small moons in the ring that help the ring keep its shape. And here is a photograph where this small moon was found after it was predicted. Um, maybe that's a lot to ask of a public health model, but it's a 
One very popular technique, which I like a lot, is to hold out a certain amount of data. If you have data from many different regions or many different years, you might hold out some data, fit your model to all the other data as well as you can, and then ask whether the model is able to predict or able to do well on data that you didn't show it. Um, and there's various complicated ways of fitting models while asking what would have happened had you fit them to less data. And you can get in very deep philosophical loops because I may do something very careful with test sets and it may not work as well as I expected. And now once I've compared my training set, which is the opposite of a test set, to my test sets, maybe I've spoiled the idea of what I'm trying to do and maybe I need to go look for a broader set of data. Um, but it's a good idea and it can help, um, in particular, it can help avoid overfitting. Um, an idea which I think Bobby has discussed with you. If you fit every single detail in your data with a model, then you probably have a model that's not going to do well outside of the data that you fit it on. Um, we can also, blessed with computers, we talked about model validation as what are the assumptions of my model world? Um, what are the assumptions in my fitting algorithm? And can I do a simulation and validate that my fitting algorithm does what it's supposed to? We can go well beyond that with simulations because my ability to fit a complicated model might require me to make a lot of simplifying assumptions and I might be nervous about some of those simplifying assumptions. My ability to simulate is much broader. So I could say, well, here's some simplifying assumptions I'm nervous about, I've validated my model. Let me do a simulation where I don't assume that people in different regions are behaving the same, or where I don't assume that there's only one strain of influenza spreading through this population. I might not be able to fit that model, but I can simulate that model, fit with my simple, fit those data with my simpler model and ask how much difference it would make. How much trouble might I be in if my assumptions aren't working very well? Um, I'm curious if anybody knows why I use this photograph as an example of a model world. We can talk about that in the review. Um, but these sort of simulations can really ask, help us figure out how well can we do with simple assumptions and which simple assumptions might be more problematic than others? Um, here's an example related to the one that Bobby showed you of our attempts to fit to some fake Ebola data. The National Institutes of Health after the West African Ebola outbreak tried to build capacity by creating model worlds and asking what sort of approaches might help us do better in fitting the next Ebola outbreak. Um, we can ask, does our model fit, even if it may not tell us much detail about what's going on, can it help us generate hypotheses? So models played a role in building and exploring the idea that late transmission, transmission during both burial ceremonies by dead people, might be important in the spread of Ebola during the West Af African outbreak. And it was hypothesized, therefore, that training and providing safe burial teams might be one way to help interrupt the spread of Ebola. Um, we did a detailed model fit where we looked at chains of transmission um, between domestic dogs and other carnivores that are capable of spreading rabies. And based on this model fit, which was kind of cute, crude, we hypothesized that domestic dogs were really the drivers of these train, train, chains of transmission, and therefore that intensive efforts focused on vaccinating domestic dogs might be one of the most effective ways of protecting other carnivores from rabies as well and protecting people from rabies. Um, again, 
Farr's idea about dirty air might have been useful at finding cholera cases, but in the end, it was Snow's idea of dirty water that allowed hypotheses to be tested successfully, in particular, the hypothesis that if you just go here, this is the actual Broad Street pump, and remove the handle, you're going to see a dramatic fall in cholera in this particular neighborhood. Um, so in conclusion, I promised that I wasn't going to answer these questions very effectively, and I hope I've lived up to that promise. The answers are not always easy. I don't want you to take me as an authority, and I don't want you to take anyone as an authority. Science is the process of not relying on authority, but on questioning answers and trying to falsify hypotheses. Um, going back to the theme of MMED, dynamic models have a huge number of possible roles in this. We use dynamic models simply to clarify thinking. If we can make a dynamical model, that means we've thought out our, out our model world pretty well. And if we haven't, if we can't finish making a dynamical model, it can simply help us ask the right questions. Dynamic models can help us understand outcomes. Is a heterogeneity enough to explain the time course of HIV epidemics? When we studied the Harari data, we found out, no, it's not, but it is necessary. You can't really even begin to get near realistic HIV epidemics without heterogeneity. Is it possible that mass drug administration could break the cycle of malaria transmission in some areas? The battle against malaria has been very complicated and multi-fronted, but this still seems like an interesting and not completely um, closed question. Predicting outcomes. What is the potential for an outbreak of a given disease in a given place? Um, what are the prospects for, say, eliminating HIV or rabies from a particular place with a particular campaign? What might happen if we change our COVID lockdown regulations at a certain time in a certain place? Dynamical models can help us find new mechanisms. Again, going back to Harari. If we make the best mathematical model dynamical model we can based on what we think is going on, we may be able to say that no, this model, the mechanisms that we think are happening are not sufficient to explain what we've seen. Um, we can evaluate models first inside the model world. Have we done everything right? Are our simulations right? Does our fitting algorithm do what we think it does? Um, and then we move on to the outside world, which could just be a matter of inspection. Does this model match the patterns that I think are important? Do I trust it to tell me anything? Can I use this model to predict beyond the data that I fit it to? Um, and can I use the model to generate and test mechanistic hypotheses? Thank you for your attention and looking forward to seeing you in person. <laughs>